Now uh, you're the host. Yeah, we're in. Great. And you can also use the rooms. So if you want to divide people in different session rooms, mm -hmm. you can do that too as host. Okay. Okay. Let's see how many people we get before we work out if we're dividing you all up. Okay. Got it. So I'll be here listening. Thank Does it you. automatically change who's on the screen as people speak? Um, you can do it either way. There's like a button on the right hand corner. You yeah. can decide whether you want to use it as gallery where you can always see everyone. Right. Or you can choose the Go look. one That's more. Yeah? Brilliant. Okay. Thank you for your help. My pleasure. Thank you, Kurt. I've never used this system before, so it's really helpful for me too. So I'm oh, really excited about this platform. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> Oof, still dealing with the fact it's 9 a.m. on a Sunday. It's good. You're here. You're here. That's all that matters. <laughs> Diane, did you guys, did you have homework to go and try and open mic last week? Um, no, we were supposed to be sourcing open mic spaces, oh, right. but I, I haven't. To be honest, at the moment, my my head and time and energies, I haven't haven't got the space at the moment. Um, um, it's kind of kind of crazy busy. I'm moving at the end of October, and I don't know where I'm moving to yet. Oh, wow, that is exciting. Yeah, I live on the edge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, did you manage to source any? Did you find any good ones near you? Um, well, what it is, um, there's a couple of suggestions that have been put on um, Belina's um, comment that she made, right. the post she did on Facebook, but I haven't had a chance to look at anything. Okay. I mean, have, you got, have you got any recommendations? Because obviously you know the circuit a bit. So. Well, mm, uh, the, the part of the problem is I don't know the circuit brilliantly because what I did, uh, mm -hmm. I've been doing this for five years. It's okay. Been, is I just built my own circuit instead. Oh, cool. So I've, I've never done the open mic thing. Um, um, what I do instead is I, I run kind of themed gigs. So the, the main thing I do is a gig called Science Show, which is a mixture of comedians and scientists and science communicators and historians and teachers doing jokes, but with a scientific theme. Oh, brilliant. I, I live in a slightly different niche. So I've done plenty of mainstream comedy gigs, but I've yeah. never done the... Um, the slogging five minute open mics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. To put it to put it in perspective, my second comedy gig was to five hundred and fifty people in the Bloomsbury Theatre, which is okay. one of London's like best comedy places. Um because I was running the gig. Right. <laughs> so I, right. I got five minutes there. Um and yeah, that's so that's the sort of way I've run it. So I I don't know this circuit. It's a thing that people ask me all the time and I'm trying mm -hmm. to find out. I mean okay. the there's, I think it's always worth going to see a show somewhere before you sign up to do the open mic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my intention is to do that. It's just at the moment, as I say, time, energy, etc. kind of, it's yeah. just kind of pushing a bit. So, so I, I think, I think, whoa, sorry, I think the thing to do is to go with a kind of analytical mindset on. Yeah. Because there's, um, there's a really interesting, so because I come at kind of comedy from a science point of view, I've always read uh, anthropology and psychology about why people laugh. Right. The big thing for me about comedy is that um, I never ask the question, is so-and-so funny? I only ever ask the question, did the audience laugh? So it's about getting laughter, not being funny, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's yeah. the judgment of whether you're funny. Okay. So, um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that, even down to the shape of the room and how the compare runs it and how it's advertised can make right. a difference to how successful a night is. So mm -hmm. I always go and sit in things with a slightly analytical mindset looking for, you know, is this, is this room and is this compare going to make a really enjoyable night? Yeah. Or should I actually skip this one because uh, that you can't win at it? There are open mics where you can't be funny. Yeah. The whole thing isn't set up to make you funny. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll tell you about more about this psychology stuff. Do you just give it another couple of minutes to see if anyone else is coming to join us? Yeah, normally people are here pretty pretty oh, there we go, there's Ruth coming. Oh, Hi. Hello Ruth. Hi. Well done for making it here. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm sitting with my kid at the moment, so you oh. might see him pop in and out. Okay. We should train your kids to perform no, as well. I 
<laughs> he could, he could. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> He's got stage presence already. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, sorry if I interrupted. No, no, no. Hello, welcome. Um, partly I was just catching up with uh, people to find out where you've got to in terms of whether you've written five minutes of stuff, whether you've had a chance to try it out anywhere or not. Mm. Have you had no. A no? <laughs> Have you written five minutes of something? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I've hit a roadblock, so I'm hoping oh. that this week I can get something through. Yeah. What kind yeah. of roadblock have you hit? Um, I think I've said it so many times that I don't find it funny anymore. Oh, right. Yeah, you need an audience then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what audiences are for. You live off their reactions instead of your own. Yeah, because I write it so many times and I'm thinking, okay, what's funny? Um, and it doesn't sound funny to me anymore. So that's yeah. why I, I've got to get a connection um, from a, a, a last idea to another idea. I've tried to, I'm trying to find a bridge, Mommy, but it's a little bit challenging at the moment. Mommy, um, to Diane, one of the things that I obsess over is that um, I've stopped worrying Mommy, about whether something's um, um, Mommy, I'm not fine. Okay. I only wonder, did the people laugh? Um, and that's that's the thing you really need an audience for. So you can try it loads of times and worry about how funny it is. But the, the thing you'll find is the minute you do your, your material in front of someone else, um, yep. there's a very good chance that they don't laugh, even though it's your favourite thing and you think it's the funniest. And you do it yeah. like five times in front of people and no one laughs, even yep. though you think it's the funniest. And then you have to throw it away. You have to cross it out and do something else. Start so over I again. Yeah, I would say even if you're not if you if you're not going to go and do a gig, it's a really good idea to just practice in front of a couple of different people, whether that's people you live with, people you work with, your friends. If you say to your friends, "Can I practice five minutes of stand-up comedy on you?" they will always say yes because they think that um, you're going to be terrible, yeah, and that they can laugh at you. But really, you're just using them to practice. Um, the only other piece of advice I have is if you do five minutes in front of one of your friends or one of your family, at the end, they will try and give you some jokes. Mm -hmm. Don't take them. Because those jokes won't sound like you. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know how much uh, Belina's has talked to you about, um, how, you know, projecting yourself through comedy. Has she talked about that? Yeah. What kind of stuff has she told you? Well, she said, for me, she was saying about making it personal to me um, rather than talking about something that's out there. Yeah. So, so that, was, that was quite good to kind of think, think about that a bit, although I've not, still not done enough yet. But as I say, I've, I'm a bit stretched at the moment. No. So my, my, set, my set's kind of shrunk from what it was. Good. <laughs> Shrinking is good. Shrinking is good. Um, <laughs> You should always, well, you'll always find, once you find the thing to write about, you write four times more than you need. And the yeah. real challenge is, is letting yourself cross out the bits that you love that uh -huh. aren't really getting the laughs. Yeah, no, I can, I can get, I, I get all of that. I, I coach people around CV writing and things oh, as right, well. Okay. As many things I do. So I get, I get the whole yeah. <laughs> editing process. Yeah. I don't have a problem with it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with a red pen, you know. Good, good. <laughs> Um, um, Ruth, have you found any opportunities nearby to try it out with an audience? I have, I ah. have, um, Yay. but it's um, <laughs> getting the guts to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to get myself psyched up about it because I'm not really very keen on it. <laughs> uh, well, I think the, the trick is that if you book something or you're going to something and you've told four or five of your friends, who are coming to see it, then you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've found the best way to, when, when somebody's wavering about doing a gig for the first time, what I do is I put their name on the website or on the flyer. Uh, and then it's very difficult for them to say, oh, actually I've decided I don't want to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing I say to Diane is that um, the other thing you can do to put your mind at ease is go to one of the things you're thinking about performing at, but just don't perform the first time. See what it's like. Because mm. I think when I deal with acts for the first time, there's lots of different things that add up to become the anxiety that they don't want to perform. 
and some of it is about light and some of it's about sound and some of it's about uh, what the crowd will be like and some of it's about um, what the compare will be like and you can you can see all that just by going along with your kind of analytical mind now that you've learned to think about comedy you can mm-hmm. go and sit and go is this actually a space where I'll do well mm. I know in London there are, there are some open mics that are brilliant They've got compares who really understand the job of a compare. They really bring the audience round um, and they're really nicely set up and everything. And there are somewhere it's almost impossible to be funny. Even if you do the same material that you always do, that is always mm-hmm. funny, some places it just doesn't work. Mm. And the, okay. the kind of psychology behind it. So I, I don't know how much Belina has talked to you about the, the psychological manipulation of a stand up gig. But. Um, it's an anthropologist called Robin Dunbar at the University of Oxford, and he wrote the book on why humans laugh. And one of the, the things that I love is that, according to the book, uh, you don't laugh because something's funny. You laugh mm-hmm. because um, you are in a group of people, either who you're friends with or who you want to be friends with, and somebody in that group is laughing. So oh. most of the times you laugh, it's because you're with people and they say something and laugh. And then oh, you so the, the compare's job is to oh, get yeah. in the room and make them feel like a group of people who want to be friends. And then my name. So um, you can see compares who do that well. And then if if a compare does that to an audience, turns them into a social group and then hands them over to you as an act in that state, it's much easier for you to be funny. Whereas a compare who doesn't do that or um, you know, tries to make the gig about them instead of being about the audience and about you, it doesn't work so well. So I would, I would urge you to go to one of these things. Don't even think I'm gonna perform the first time. Mm. Just have a look and kind of critically look at how does the whole thing work. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think it's worth doing it if you can do it. Mm. Um, but yeah, find yourself somewhere where you're going to succeed if you can. You know what I mean? So I, yeah. I um, I've run gigs in the past with new acts where uh, I've, I've been running a gig at a conference or something like that, and I always have a rule that I'm allowed to pull the gig right up till the minute when the first person goes on stage, because I won't let you all um, suffer. I won't let you go in front of a crowd who aren't willing to laugh. Um, so I wanted to, um, do either of you have five minutes you'd like to do now for us to have a look at? Okay. Yeah. Are you happy to do five, Ruth? Diane, how yeah. are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I mean, I haven't got five minutes. That's the That's thing where right. I trip it down. It's, we'll we'll and see I'm, what you've got. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Ruth, do you want to go first? Since you okay. shouted keenly first. Um, okay. So, um, it's a little bit half year and a half day. I'm going to move a while. Um, and that's because I was writing it. So, I'm... Okay, anyway. Okay, wait. I have to do a little thing. I have to do a little thing for the benefit of Diana and Luca, and I'm going to comp- even though we're on opposite sides of the world and talking via a computer, I'm still going to compare you as if this was a proper gig, all right? All right. Okay, so, uh, people of the internet, um, I'm very excited. Uh, new act, what I'm working with. I know she's got a lot of potential. I know you're going to absolutely love her. Would you please welcome to the stage, Ruth? Yay! So, hi, my name is Ruth. Now, you know how people ask you what you want to be when you grow up? Oh. <laughs> like any good Asian child, I wanted to be a doctor, an engineer, and an actress. <laughs> the problem was, I was lazy, bad at math, and can you imagine, I was kicked out of a acting class because I didn't know how to cry. Oh, but all said and done, I was really willing to be anything <laughs> except one thing, Me. and that is to be my mother. <laughs> the most diligent, 
responsible, <laughs> terrible Asian tiger mom there was. <laughs> so just the other day, my husband and I were late. Like your <laughs> boss is going to notice late. Yeah, yeah. We, yep, we needed to get to work and the trio needed to get to school. <laughs> now, I love my son. He's a genius in the making. He's a genius <laughs> at choosing the best timing to teach me about being the best version of myself. <laughs> so one moment he's an angel, and the very next moment he's Donald Trump. <laughs> so he's kicking and screaming and sprawled on the floor. Like that would keep me from hauling him off to school. Yep. But unlike my mother, I went to parenting school and they said you had to talk to little children like you talk to adults. <laughs> so I got down to his level, which pretty much meant I was on the floor, spread eagle, in a dress. <laughs> with as much dignity as I could master and very respectfully went, Noah's such a good little boy. <laughs> If you go to school now, you get some Lego when you get home. Yeah, yeah. It's Lego. It's freaking Lego. Yeah. But it didn't work. <sighs> so I got out the big guns. I got my husband to sing him a song while I tried to put on the shoes. It should Mommy. have been easy. It really should have been easy. Mommy, but my husband me. forgot the lyrics. Mommy, do not want to wheels on the bus. <laughs> so, let's all do it. It's so easy, right? The wheels on the bus go round and round. Round and round. The husband. <laughs> the husband didn't know that. And I, <laughs> I got a mouthful of shoe. Oh. The son was acting like a little. Donald Trump. If I didn't do something about it, I'd be kicked out of my own home. <laughs> where he would build a great, great wall of Lego across the front door. <laughs> so I couldn't come back in. And I need to apply for legal papers. <laughs> to live with him. No, not on your life, buddy. So without warning, with the basic primal instinct to preserve my standard of living and quality of life, it worked like a charm. <laughs> the little agent Donald Trump Mommy. stopped crying, wore his shoes, and stood at the door waiting for us, like Mommy. a good child. <laughs> Suddenly, it dawned on me. I turned to my husband and said, Oh my goodness, I think I just became my mother. <laughs> <laughs> good night. Okay, I changed it. You see us? That's it. Very good. Very good. Brilliant work. So Diane, what did you think of Ruth's set? Yeah, I really, I really like her set. Um, one of the things I think is really powerful about what we, what you're doing, is the visuals. I, because I, I've, I've got the kicking and screaming, the laying on the floor in your dress, wrecking your <laughs> mask work clothes, um, the Lego wall, and then actually almost um, like um, Oliver Twist kind of going with your legal papers, please can I come in, you know. Um, <laughs> so I've got all these images that float yeah. around, which are great. And then the other bit that lands really well with me is the empathising when your mother comes out of your mouth, because I've done yeah. that with my yeah. son, so yeah. you know, I understand that one. So yeah, those, those are all the bits that really land well with me. Thank Brilliant. you. <laughs> so Ruth, how did you feel it went? Um, I feel that it's going a little bit better. It's connecting a bit more because yeah. the last few times it wasn't really landing very well as in yeah. like, there were lots of bits that were still not enough information to yeah. give a, a greater, greater idea. It's not really there yet. Uh, a lot of stuff that Anne's heard before already. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, like the intro, I just added mm -hmm. a bit more. So mm -hmm. I think I wanted to say a bit more about the horrible oh, yeah. Asian mother that I have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm just looking up the link for something, um, yes. which I will send over to you. Right, this. Yeah. That's the one. Um, so there's, whenever I teach people comedy, there's, there's three basic tricks that I talk about a lot. Yeah. And um, I think it would be useful for you to have a think about them, because I think that's, that's a really good set. Um, mm. Great framework. Um, I think what I would challenge you to do is to think about where that framework can be built on a little bit more. Because I think okay. what you've got there, that is very funny. Right? Okay, thank you. The question is how you take it to extremely funny from here. And I don't think yeah. you need any more story, but there's lots of points within your story where, uh, as someone who writes a lot of comedy, I hear you start on a journey, okay. and then you go back to the story. And you just start, and it might be worth you looking at whether some of those can become longer. But let me tell you about these three rules that are in the book that I've just sent you a link to. Okay. The first rule is, uh, in order to be funny on stage, your opinions should always be much more extreme than they are in real life. And you're allowed to have those opinions when you're on stage because people know that you're trying to be funny. But they should reflect yeah. your real opinions. So if in real yeah. life you like something, on stage you love it. Yeah. Uh, you dislike it, you hate it. If you hate it, it's the worst thing that has ever happened. Yeah. You know, so, you know, your, your husband forgetting um, the words to wheels on the bus, if you're on stage, that makes him the stupidest man who has ever lived. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you start to question why you're with him in the first place. <laughs> you start digging out his old qualification certificates to see if they're forged. There's so many places yeah. you can go with that if you, have, you take a very extreme opinion. So, you know, if you... Yeah. You said you wanted to be a tiger mum and, you know, you talk about how you love your son and you can yeah. take that to all sorts of places where, you know, yeah. if another child looks at your son wrong, you have been killed. Um, yeah. There's all sorts of places you can go with that. So I think extreme opinions are really important to me, but they have to be amplified from where you are. Okay. You can't go on stage and say that you love something you hate convincingly. You know, it's got to be the, the real way you think about things. So I would urge you with that, that there are, there's more you can do with some of them to, to make your opinions on it much more obvious to a crowd. Because this crowd only sees you for five minutes and they're laughing and they might be drinking and they might be doing other stuff. So they, um, you really need to make very, very clear to them. A bit where, yeah. Um, so the other, the second thing that I always teach people is that you should use lots and lots of detail in order to make your stories feel real. Because then when you do the ridiculous bit, the, the ridiculousness makes the joke. But you have to feel you're in that world, and the way to do that is detail. So when you talked about uh, Lego, for instance, yeah. the way you said, this is Lego, this is freaking Lego, what you could have done is put in something a lot more detailed in order to amplify the power of Lego. So you would have said something like, this is Lego. We're talking about the Lego Harry Potter castle, or this is Star Wars Lego featuring so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and just to make it, the more detailed it is, the realer it is. Yeah, so okay. Let us do the, that's the most amazing Lego, by telling us exactly what Lego it is that he does okay. or that he builds the wall out of. Okay. I like the idea that the wall will be part brick, part stormtroopers, part bits of Death Star, you know? <laughs> okay. So put in loads and loads and loads of detail. So then the third, okay. rule, the third rule that I teach people is, um, and these are in this, this book that I've sent you, where they're, they're written much better than I could ever tell you them, is the idea of the aside. So when you say something, being able to step to one side of it and then comment on what you've just said. So almost stepping out of your own set. And partly there, you're, you're almost doing, if you were the cleverest person in the audience watching this set, what would be the thing that they think they said? So for okay. instance, um, trying to look back on what you did with this. Uh, yeah, so you said uh, you, you, you've been told to talk to little children like you talk to adults. Yep. And then you did, uh, when you talked to your son, you do a very like, um, um, this kind of voice. Yeah. yeah. So the audience's head goes, but you've been told that you should talk to your son how you talk to adults. You've done this voice. Yeah. So you should continue yeah. in that voice and go, and this is also the voice that I use to, to talk to adults. Of course, I do all my work business meetings in this voice. 
uh, and um, just because that way you can <laughs> step outside of what you're doing and have a look at it, and then you comment on it, and then step back into it. And it's yeah. powerful, but the way to write those is you've got to practice in front of other people. Yep. What you'll find happens is, uh, if you're a normal person, there's something between your brain and your mouth that stops you saying stupid things. Right? <laughs> I don't have one, because I'm a professional comedian, but other people have this thing. If you, if you do this in front of someone else, that will turn off automatically because you'd be so kind of piped up from the adrenaline of I've got to do this in front of someone else. That will shut, that will just shut off. And as you do your bit, you'll find that it makes you, you start saying some other things that aren't in the script. Oh, just the and pressure this. of doing it and where, pe where the person's laughing or not laughing and you'll suddenly say something like, no. uh, I thought you were going to laugh at that bit. I suppose I should just go back to talking about Lego. Uh, it turns out all you wanted to hear was five minutes detailing different types of Lego. Um, and you'll find stuff like that just comes pouring out when you do it in front of other people. And what you can do is some of the things you say that you haven't scripted will be brilliant and they'll be as good as the script, in which case you write them into the script and you pretend that they were there the whole time. <laughs> any that you do that you don't then laugh at, you just throw away. You go, yeah, yeah. Just the pressure of the moment. Um, yes. and at the end of this, I'll send you a link to my first ever stand-up set so that you can see me trying that. And there's bits where I do a bit and it works. There's bits where I throw a bit in and it just fails completely. Um, yeah. But it's fine because usually I'm just talking while people are laughing, so it's a problem. So... So I think, I think the thing I would say to you is you've got a brilliant framework there, right? The question is, what else do you want to bolt onto it? How can you amplify the bits that are funny already? And I think okay. those, those three tricks should help you to do it. Yeah. You know? So, um, you, you know, instead, instead of loving your son, you would say, you know, I love my son more than anyone has ever loved anyone else in the entire world. <laughs> In fact, the greatest person who has ever lived, he is uh, Mozart and Gandhi, rolled into one. He, you, know, you can amplify it and amplify it and exaggerate it and exaggerate it. And that's fine, because that is how you feel, but just turn up a little bit. I sometimes say you should have the opinions on stage that you would have if you never had to worry about the consequences of your opinions. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was a really good five. Thank you. Uh, oh, and your pace is brilliant. The number one thing that I have to feed back to people when they're trying stand up is slow down. Whereas your pace is perfect. You gave, you, us, you. you gave us lots of space to laugh when there was a punchline. Because I, I find with new acts a lot of the time, you know, what you want to do is just go really fast. It's like, I've, yeah. got, I've got 800 words to get through. I'm going to get through them. And then you say a joke and um, you, we laugh and you just keep talking through the left hand. And that's no good. You've got to pause like you did. Pause and that stuff. And the other thing is um, the timing can help indicate when there's a joke. So earlier on, before you joined, Diane told me a joke, but it was in the middle of normal conversation and I missed it completely. <laughs> uh, which was my fault. My fault entirely. But it, there was a clever bit of wordplay, but because I was in normal conversation mode, I didn't pick it up. Whereas yeah. it's gone. Uh, so what Diane said was, you know, I always wanted to live in Glastonbury, but now I live in Woodstock Road, which is as close as I could get. And I thought, that's miles away from Glastonbury. <laughs> Whereas if you, do it, if you do it with like pauses, if it becomes, I always wanted to live in Glastonbury. Now, however, I live in Woodstock Road. This is as close as I can get. You put those pauses and emphasize the words I have to hear, then I'll get it. It was yeah. a good joke, Diane. It was my fault for not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Nah, <laughs> how, how would you know comedic timing? Because that's the that's the number one thing. Watch people, watch YouTube clips of other people. Work out where they are uh, leaning on jokes. And I would say also, don't watch YouTube clips of really, 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 really famous people, because the audience watching them have an expectation that everything they say is hilarious. But yep. if you watch uh, like Stuart Lee. Stuart Lee doesn't even have to do jokes, and his audience are giggling because they're at a Stuart Lee gig. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> before it even starts. But if you watch people who are kind of on the way up, 
dig around, find people who are doing good gigs, but aren't completely world famous. Because so much of laughter um, is about expectations. So I've, I've done lots of different gigs. I've done the same material for lots of different people. If you are at a thing where everybody in the room expects that they are going to laugh, they will laugh. And part of that is you want to be at a gig where people have paid to get in because that makes them think it's going to be valuable. And you have to do comedy at things labelled comedy. So if you, if you go and try and do a comedy set at a mixed open mic where there's music and all sorts of other stuff, it's really hard to be funny because a lot of the audience aren't there to laugh. If you go into mm-hmm. a gig that's all comedy, it's much, much easier because the audience is okay. in comedy mode the whole time. Okay. But yeah, don't do free gigs. Yeah. Because a, a, free, a free audience comes in and goes, uh, go on then, entertain me. Mm. Whereas like, a paid audience, uh, they want to prove to themselves that they're very clever and invest their money well. So they're ready. <laughs> the minute you do a joke, your first joke, they will just go because they're so happy. Okay. Cool. That's um, so weird. Yeah, well, it's, it's yeah, it, it, because I mostly MC gigs, I spend a lot of time thinking about all this psychological manipulation. Um, but that's what you're doing with the crowd, is that you're, you're making them love each other, uh, and then you are handing them over to the act. Diane, do you want to have a go at doing your bit for us? Sure. Sure, let me just... Wait, I need to introduce you. Okay. Is that Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, hello, people of the world. Uh, it's very exciting. Another new act here. Somebody I know got a lot of promise. Going to be very, very big on the circuit in coming years. Would you please welcome to stage, Diane? Hi, my my name is Diane Coots, and yesterday I was thinking about stuff. Do you ever think about stuff? <laughs> I do. <didn't. laughs> Are you so That's brilliant? I use the word stuff when I'm talking about life, the universe, and getting my tax returns done. <laughs> we sometimes get power from stuff that we do. When I was about seven years old, I was in school playgrounds eating a little box of raisins. You know the ones, the red and yellow packaging? Yep, yeah, yeah. Loved, loved those raisins. My friends asked if they could have some too. I got them all to line up, and I gave them one each. <laughs> but they are only little boxes. So that's when I discovered raisin power. <laughs> so I am a product of the self-development movement. Look on my bookshelves, you'll see that I buy a lot of books. Mm. I read some, put some in a pile to be read later. Occasionally, I put something into practice, like when I learned how to read more quickly. Still doesn't seem to help with that pile of books going down, though. <laughs> So this self-development stuff generates a lot of books and a lot of hot air. (laughs) All of those bookshelves, instead of absorbing the hot air produced by us humans. Recently, I was talking with a dear friend. She said that a book she's reading is great. This book has tests that you have to do as you go along. And the way the book's written means that you really do the work and changes your thinking. Seems to be changing her thinking. She stopped worried about her work and is focusing on her next holiday. (laughs) I started to think that this study would be a good thing for me to do. I could do with some changes in my thinking. My friend said that you have to make a commitment to working on this stuff every day. For eight weeks. (laughs) Eight weeks! Would I actually do something every day for eight weeks? Of course I can do something every day for eight weeks. Brush my teeth every day, don't I? <laughs> yeah, I was seriously questioning myself. Would I make the time? Hmm, make the time. That's ridiculous. How can I make the time? I mean, people who know about this stuff say time is a construct. You know, I really don't get this time as a construct idea, so I did a bit of research. What's actually said, time is a social construct. And what any group thinks about time depends on the way they interact with each other and their socialization process. Okay, so if I want to make time, it seems that I need to get a group to agree what that time might be and mean, and then socialize the rest of the group into it. Hmm. If I use raisin power, maybe (laughs) I can do it. Maybe I could actually commit to reading a book and doing some tests for eight weeks. Maybe. 
eight weeks, that's 56 days. Okay, less than two calendar months. I was pregnant for nine months, sick every day, and I survived that. <laughs> eight weeks, buddy. Easy peasy. I don't know about you, but I often think about stuff. Just this morning, I was thinking about how wonderful it is to be beside water, walking by a river, a canal, or the seaside. I was brought up by the seaside. Do you think it's weird how many people will drive to the beach, sit in their cars, and drive home again? <laughs> My name's Diane Coots. You have all been wonderful. Thank you, and good night. <laughs> Amazing work, Diane. Well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ruth, what did you think of Diane's set? Um, I like the raisins. The raisins came in. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I really, yeah, I believe you believe it's just that. Between you lot. Yeah, I, I like raisin power. That, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there was one part which was a little bit difficult for me to process. I think also because, yeah, I was doing something at the same time. Uh, okay. Just, That's socialising. a good simulator of an audience, though. Because an audience, yeah. you know, as much as the room's going to be dark and they're only focused on your face, they're still also drinking and they have lives. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And, that's the, and that's the phone. Not being <laughs> the raise of focus is a good way to uh, listen to these things. So go on, yeah. tell. Because I, I, I heard the raisin power thing. It, it resonated with me. But when it got to that bit about this, something about the socialization process, that, uh -huh. that bit, yeah. I... Um, I couldn't quite see the connection okay. as yeah. quickly as I would have liked to. Yeah. And so I was wondering, okay, so where, where's the funny in this? Because yeah. you know, uh, I want to laugh, so I'm trying yeah. to look for the funny in it. Um, yeah. So that bit, well, uh, okay, I, I don't know. Was it supposed to be like jargon to be funny or was it driving yeah. to a point? Yeah, I'm still working with that one because I'm trying to find a way to make it shrink. So, so I'm kind of getting... There's all these clever people do this clever stuff and then actually, yeah. oh, maybe I can do something with it. You know, I'm kind of trying to, but I haven't quite got it. I get it because it's too long. Because I know once yeah. I was saying, I know it's too long. I've just yeah. got to how to shrink it down. Yeah. Maybe you could do the aside thing. Da, 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 and then, you know, the aside. Exactly. Like, I mean, that's okay. what I assumed you were uh, going to do. I assumed you were going to do that whole long bit about time is uh, socially constructed based on the cultural milieu of a, to summarise... <laughs> Time is a load of bollocks. Yes. Something like that, where you just yeah. load them it. one way of thinking, then you give them another way of thinking straight away. Yeah. And I, I thought that was where you were going with it. And the other thing I thought about that bit was that there's a really clever thing you're doing there, um, and it's going to be really brilliant once you work it out. Because what okay. you're doing is you're, you're leading the audience. So what, what you want overall is you want the audience to realise that you're going to say that you can make up your own time as long as you control enough people. Right. Where you're getting to. You want them to realise that yeah. just before you say it. Because right. then you are flattering the audience. They will all laugh when you actually reveal it because they've got it. It's like if you do uh, gigs that are entirely puns, part of the challenge is the audience has to work out what the pun is before you get to the actually saying it. Because okay. When you say it, you get this huge release, and they all think they're so clever because they got yeah. it. So I, I <laughs> where uh, all the punchlines are the names of films starring Nicolas Cage. Right. And they, uh, in this film, um, Nicolas Cage uh, with a group of his friends, they they get an industrial unit in a rough part of London, and all they do is they just sell empty bottles full of the air from this crappy industrial bit of London. But they claim that it's air from uh, a healing shrine in Tibet, where and if you inhale this air, you get much, much, much. <laughs> the whole thing's just really fraudulent. And the audience is going, it's con air, it's con air, it's con air, it's con air. So when I then go, con air, they all laugh. <laughs> so I think that's, that's what I would say with this, is that you, you are brilliantly leading us. So you give us the idea that time is constructed by a group of people agreeing how it works. Then you've yeah. got to lead us into the idea that then you, if you control the group of people, you can control time. Yes. And then you bring back, there's only one way to solve this, raisin power. Yeah. And the audience yeah. will get there at the same time as you and they will fall over themselves. They'll be laughing all over the shop and the whole yeah. thing is really good. because it's a really brilliant bit. You just got to work out what the, the roadmap is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. That's great. Do you have any other thoughts, Ruth? 
no, but that was it because um, the front bit was excellent. And then when I got to the end, I wasn't really sure what, where I was going with it or like what I remembered out of it. So by having that raising power, bringing raising power yeah. back to the top and tail, it uh, would have been awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so the lovely snoring technique, if you read um, Keith Johnstone's Impro, which I'm sure Billy has told you about, there's a lovely storytelling technique where you just refer back to something earlier in the story and it tricks the human mind into thinking that that's a whole story that's complete. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be halfway through the next person's set before they realise that you haven't really tied up all the loose ends. <laughs> um, the other thing is if you refer back to something from earlier, the audience, uh, they, they go in their brains, oh, I remembered that thing from earlier, how clever I am. And then they laugh, like a callback. Yep. So Diane, um, I was thinking about your set, which I think is a great set, and just in terms of the same three rules that I talked about, about how to add stuff in. Yeah. Uh, and I think your personality is starting to come through in that set really nicely, but you could turn it up a bit. Okay. Um, would, would be one thing that I would say. Um, so, things that I really like. Oh yeah. Um, so your first line, do you ever think about stuff? Brilliant line. Um, and the things you can think about and the things you can experiment with from there are really interesting. So having said to your audience, do you ever think about stuff? And then you can, get, then you can decide, are you the sort of person who berates their audience? So uh, do you go, do you ever think about stuff? I mean, most of you look like you probably haven't thought about <laughs> stuff. Specifically, or how can I make myself look okay to leave the house? You know, if you're that kind of person, you can go that way. You could go the other way. You could go, uh, are, are you the kind of um, act who just massively butters their, act, their audience up? So do you ever think about stuff? Well, I mean, most of you look like you spend most of your day thinking about the great macroeconomic problems of the world and how you might solve them. But because you kind of set yourself up there, that's a brilliant joke, but you, you, within the line, do you ever think about stuff? He's basically, that's not only a punchline, it's a setup for another joke. Okay. You might as well, having done all the work, you might as well have this next punchline as well. <laughs> it's been so much work into that. Um, it's really nice for all the um, mm. And there's a few other bits like that where, again, if you, if you were hearing it from our side, yeah. you think, well, the obvious thing here is, and kind of step outside of it. So you said, um, I brush my teeth every day, don't I? And my, my question was, do you? <laughs> you know? Because there's a thing there, again, where depending on the, the kind of persona you're trying to put across, I would tend to... Uh, so my, my comic persona is um, he's very proud, he's quite cruel, but he's also uh, ultimately a failure. Um, he uh, will tell you about all of his successes, but only ever in the context that a failure is coming afterwards. So if I'd said that line, it would be... Uh, I brush, I brush my teeth every day, don't I? I mean, well, actually, I don't. Sometimes if I've had a bit too much whiskey, I just force them. Uh, you know? Do you say it in that speed? Uh, it depends. It depends. But for a gig, yeah, I would do it that quickly. Oh. I brush my teeth every day, don't I? Because uh, my, my part of my thing is he's quite quick. Um, yeah, I, I steam words out very fast and then stop dead. So you can tell where the jokes are supposed to be and where the punchlines are supposed to be. Um, and yeah, the other thing, Diane, was right at the end, the sit in their cars bit. Mm. I would wonder whether that could go in somewhere other than the end. Because actually finishing on Raisin Power yeah, okay. is really good because that is going to get you such a big laugh because you're going to get the laugh of a very good joke combined with the laugh of the audience feeling that they're being flattered and really enjoying like, their own cleverness that they managed to work out that that might be where you're going. Combine all of that, that's a really big finish. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Whereas okay. observational stuff, like the people sit in their cars at the beach thing. Um, I, I don't go to the beach very often, I've never seen that. Um, <laughs> you know, just because I, I live in central London, I used mm. to live at the point in the UK that is for the stream of sea. I haven't seen people go and do that. You know, when I go to the inside, we go to the beach non-stop because we haven't seen one for a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, observational stuff like that, you always have to be ready because it can go two ways. Your audience can be like, yes, I have seen that. <laughs> or a lot of them can be like, I haven't seen that. 
Yeah. 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 You've got to be ready for that joke to go, why do you want to do this? And it doesn't land, you then yeah. need the recovery line. So right. you can write both. The, the, one of the joys of comedy is that nobody knows what you've written beforehand and what you haven't. Yeah. You can throw a joke out there knowing that it can go one of two ways and you can write ready for both of those and then yeah. look super quick and clever. So if you did that joke and it didn't land, you yeah. could do something like, oh, I didn't realise that I was in an entire audience full of people who just couldn't afford to go to the seaside when they were growing up. So you don't yeah. have brilliant seaside references. Or yeah. do you know what we call people like you, you know. Um, and they'll think, wow, that's so clever and brilliant and fast that that joke didn't land and Diane's recovered. Whereas actually she's written it beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of my friends had a bit in her hour-long show where she asks a member of the audience what superpower they'd like to have and then riffs on it. Uh, she had 200 written beforehand for all wow. the most common things you might say. She had <laughs> all written. So that what she me memorized. Yeah. So what it, well, it's easy to memorise stuff you've written yourself because you only have to remember the gist. But she, um, yeah, she was ready. If you were like X-ray vision, joke. If you said flight, joke. Teleportation, joke. Uh, being irresistible, joke. But, but you can do that. Nobody in the crowd knows what you've written and what you haven't. So yes. you can do that. Prepare. Um, mm. so the other thing I wanted to talk to you all a bit about when you, is about when you get as far as the stage and how you project yourself. So I talked about how you're, you've got to have very extreme versions of your own opinions. Part of how you're going to express those is through the way that you stand and move. Mm -hmm. Belina's told you a bit about status, is that right? Yeah. How you can project yeah. that? Yeah. So one thing that I've found very useful is, um, and I can't do it with you guys because of the technological limitations of what we're doing, is to, um, next time you stand up and practice your five minute bit with a fake microphone, um, video yourself. And then okay. watch the video with the sound off. And it's sometimes easier to get somebody else to watch it with you, who ideally can step away from it being you. So what I wanted to try doing um, is that I've got somebody who I taught on one of Belina's classes, and I've got a set that he did at one of my gigs. And I'm going to try and share my screen and show you the YouTube clip. And it would be really nice if we can talk about what, what kind of person you think he is just based on how he's moving the body on stage. Is that all right? Right, so if I click share screen, uh, I click that one. You know, the, my, you know the water comes from my feet. Okay, wait. And if I click that. Oops, off. Oops. Okay, I'll try that again, hold on. Water from my Share screen, feet. that one. Okay, can you see Adam now? Yeah. Okay, so if I click play on him, I've muted him. So what I'm really interested in is just your thoughts on just watching him move, what kind of person is he? What's the persona that he's got on stage? What do you think? Because audiences make decisions very quickly about the kind of act you are. Mm, sure. So you can notice some things. He's not moving his feet at all. Mm -hmm. So he uh, is he's doing a kind of classic public speaking thing. Um, what else do you notice? He got, he moved down, he sort of bent over to, as if he was trying to pull the audience in by doing that. Yeah. Early on. But look oh. at his face, right? Smiling a lot. Yeah. He's, but he's also smiling in a, I would like to be liked kind of smile rather than a, I'm super confident and in charge kind of smile. Don't you think? Okay. Yeah. 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 And the, and the hand gestures is repetitive? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very confined to one space? Yeah. His hand gestures aren't really doing a lot other than being hand gestures. So it's weird. When I first met Adam, he, he, so his set is about kind of what an amazing kind of rock star kind of guy he is. 
but you can see this is not how a rock star stands this is not how a rock star moves mm -hmm. that was not how a rock star dances <laughs> that was how an awkward dad dances um and so one of the things I tried to say to him was, if you want to have a set that is all about, I am such an amazing rock star. And so your body has to do that as well, because otherwise the audience look at you and they think the humor is that you're saying you're a rock star, but you're standing like a slightly nervous teacher. Mm. You know, um, and Adam he does a lot of this looking like he wants to be liked. Yeah. Whereas if you watch a rock star, they just assume you love them. And you can see that in their body language straight away. So he's very fixed, as if he's slightly paralyzed. And a lot of the, when he does gestures, they look quite acted. They don't look natural. Mm. That makes sense. And so it's yeah. worth videoing yourself to notice these things, because it, sometimes it can undermine what you're doing, and sometimes it can massively add to what you're doing. So I did this with, uh, so Belina does these live courses and we, we videoed each other and we sat and watched them all together. And yeah. there was somebody who, her entire body language, as I described it to her, was um, to come across as somebody who's drinking wine with a friend and trying to tell them something important, but they're just not listening. And you could see as you went through this, her body language got more and more insistent, trying to bring the person in. It's like, well, you've got to decide if that's what your comedy is. Because otherwise your body's doing something different. So just to give you a comparison, um, let me find you this one, right? Let me move this. Okay. So this is a recent video of me. I'm doing roughly the same as him. I'm standing roughly still, I'm moving my hands a bit. How does it look in comparison? Slightly camp. Slightly uh, camp is exactly part of what I'm going for, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, the way you just moved then, that looks as if you were emphasizing something. Yep. Like you, got, you don't care. Exactly, exactly. This is, so this is an improvised bit. I'm just doing nine minutes. Uh, it contains a lot of telling the audience off for laughing at things that I think aren't funny enough or clever enough. Um, it tells them off for liking Star Wars and Star Trek and all sorts of other things. Um, the camp thing is really interesting because it took me a year and a half to realize that I come across as slightly camp on stage. And right. It became a thing I have to own. So I now have a whole bit where I talk about my parents coming to my gigs and sitting at the front and writing notes. And I, I do this big lead up where I talk about how different my life is to my parents' lives and how I live in London and they live in Somerset and they're very Christian and I drink a lot and all this sort of thing. Um, and the punchline is that right at the end, um, my dad uh, turns to my mum at a gig and very loudly whispers, oh, He's straight. And that brings <laughs> the houses down. Because they, just because of what you've picked up in the body language, slightly camp, audiences assume I'm gay. Right. Okay. So I drop that line in. And yeah, I mean, I did that uh, um, in Guildford, which is, uh, for Ruth's benefit, a posh town in Surrey where there isn't a lot of comedy. And I did that line. And um, I had to actually, it was really weird because one girl just kept laughing for three and a half minutes through everything else I was doing at that joke and was crying and had to be like, <laughs> but it made the rest of the gig really hard because I was talking and she's still laughing away at that. And I had to go over and go, are you, are you all right? What's wrong? And she was just laughing. She just went, <laughs> you're straight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's a thing of, I had to understand that that's how audiences see me. Yeah. And that's a really important thing is to learn. And, and that's why you should watch the video of yourself ideally watch it with people who don't know you very well so they can just see the version of you on the screen because the thing to remember about all of this is that you on stage is not you in real life it's an amplified version of you in real life it's a small part of you spread out and um, that means that they won't look at the person on stage in five minutes and go oh i really understand diane now i really understand ruth now they're going to see that person and that person might not be the same as you 
but you can control who that person is, but you've got to be aware of what they look like and what they do. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Amazing. Yes. Right. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit, um, so body language, we did some exercises yeah. on that. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to do, I'll send you a couple of videos and stuff to watch after this. The other thing I wanted to mention was what do you do uh, if you forget where you are and you go quiet and you stop? Because everybody's scared of that. You know, I talked about how I like to take away all the things the acts are scared of one after another. Everybody is scared of what if I just stop? Mm -hmm. So going back to the psychological manipulation that is comedy, when you are in front of an audience, what you've got is a great big group of friends in the room and you're one of the friends, but you're the best one out of all the friends. And that's why when you start your set, you come on stage and you either do something that's funny straight away so that they laugh, or you'll see comedians come out and go, how are you doing, Romford? Gee, and what the comedian is really saying is, I'm in charge now, aren't I? And then the noise everyone makes is the acknowledgement that they're now in charge. So the problem with you going quiet is that um, it's like realizing that the emperor has no clothes. The audience is suddenly like, wait a second. They're just a normal human being. They're not better than all of us. So you can never go quiet. So what I always tell people to do is, um, remember, if you go quiet, if you forget where you are, you have to keep noises coming out of your face. And it doesn't matter whether these are scripted noises, unscripted noises, or just noises. So you'll see comedians, and if you forget where you are, people will literally go, uh, oh, hmm, mm, 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 yes, hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. Aha. Mm. Yeah. all you're doing is buying time to remember what you're supposed to be saying. So what I do is I have a whole scripted bit where I go, cool, wow, mm. you laughed at that bit. I wasn't expecting you to laugh at that bit. That's really thrown me. Where are we? Well, we did the bit about that, and I'll say any joke I remember doing, and then they'll remember that bit, and they'll flattered, and they'll laugh. So we did the bit about the octopus, and you all really loved that. And then I go, and then we did the bit about the starfish, and you already love that. And then I'll just pick on someone at random and go, apart from you, madam, you hated it for some reason. But anyway, because um, it also makes them think that as a comedian, you're monitoring every single member of the audience all the time to see if they laugh. But you've got to keep these noises coming out um, until you remember where you are. But if you just keep talking, your confidence will be such that you won't forget where you are. Um, mm -hmm. You can bring it back. And then if you go into what is clearly you having lost where you are, but you've kept talking and you bring the gig back, you are a hero. You are the greatest comedian ever. They will all laugh and laugh and laugh because you've, it's like a roller coaster. It looked like it was going to be really dangerous, but then it was really fun. Um, whereas if it's, if you forget where you are and you stop talking, it's like a roller coaster, but they haven't built the second half. So it's just really dangerous and then everyone dies. So it's just a thing to bear in mind is have something so that you are aware that this is a risk and you know that all you have to do is keep talking. Even if what you say is, I've forgotten where I am. But the weird thing is, the guy who taught me how to do stand-up said, you've got to keep talking. And he said, I could even just sing songs. La, la, la. <laughs> uh, and they'll laugh and they'll come back and they'll love it. And they don't know whether you scripted that. You might be a brilliant experimental comedian who intentionally loses it and comes back. They just don't know. Cool. So... Ruth, you're going to go and do your five somewhere. I'm going to do my five <laughs> somewhere, so someday, sometime. <laughs> no, do it soon. I'm going to watch it first. I'm going to watch. I'm going to yeah, watch. video yourself and watch it back. But when you watch it back, watch it with the sound off. Oh. Because yeah. otherwise, all you hear is the jokes you've written. And what you've got to do is look at yourself. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, when you have that, when you go for a comedy stand up, would you be holding a mic or would there usually be a, a lap or mic? Right. Hold one, always hold one. Because holding one says, I'm doing stand-up comedy now. You know I said how it's all about the audience's expectations. If you have a this or you have a this, the audience, the audience don't think it's comedy. If you have a thing here, they assume you're going to do a TED Talk or you're Whitney Houston. If you have a thing here, they assume you're being interviewed on the telly. Um, so I don't have a mic within grabbing distance. But if you are standing with a microphone like that, then they think you're doing stand-up comedy. So you, there's a TV show in Britain called Mock the Week, 
Yeah, there's a section on it where the, there's a load of comedians and they, they actually do a bit of stand-up. And they, when they do a bit of stand-up, there's a stand and a microphone and they take the microphone and they talk into it. It's not plugged into anything. They're wearing clip-on mics that's really recording the sound. But just so that you're sure that this bit is stand-up, they've got a microphone that they're talking into. It's not connected to anything. Um, so, yeah, you, you have to have to have to. And so the worst thing you can do is get trapped. So if a microphone's on a stand, here's a stand, here's a microphone. If you talk behind it, you notice you can't see the bottom half of my face. So you don't know when I'm like really angry or really happy or really, and so you can't control the audience. So both of your sets are bits where you really want the audience to empathize, but also they are bits where you really want the audience to just laugh at you. And this controls part of that. So when you've got a microphone, you have to take it off a stand and then you have to hold it just below your mouth so that people can see your mouth so that they know when you're being silly and when you're being serious and all that sort of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. I can't hear you, Ruth. You've gone quiet. Sorry, I saw the kid. Hey, <laughs> Can, I ask you another... <laughs> Can I ask you another question? Yeah. Um, how much overacting do you do with your body? Because I realized that the other guy that you showed us was doing something with his hand, yeah. but in your set, you were just standing around with your hands in your pocket. In public speaking, that's like, nah, you don't put your hands in your pocket. Yeah. So, um, how much, uh, how do you say, overacting is required in stand up? So, I would say it depends on what you're trying to do. I think everybody should move more than they think they should. Sorry, no, got to wait. No, no. Yeah. Uh, emergency. I'll tell Diane and then we'll send you this recording. Uh, Diane, I think the, the thing that um, everybody should move more than they think they should. It's very easy to get paralyzed on stage and you look like you've been, you're so frightened of the lights that you can't move. Um, okay. you, you should always move around. So my thing about like hands in pockets and whatever, what I'm doing is my character is so proud that he has almost disdain for the audience that he's appearing in front of. So okay. he does, you know, 10 his way through that you remember, he will just be like, listen, right, we're all here, we're doing this thing, uh, I'm gonna have whatever body language I want, because it's about me, uh, it's not about you lot, you think you're my customers, you're not, you're my audience, and I am an artist, prepared to appreciate some art. Um, so that's why he's super relaxed on stage, is that <clears throat> he doesn't care that he's on stage, and he doesn't care who you are. Um, and that's the way that <clears throat> I found works for me. There are people who do a much more kind of contrived, much more affected act, but that it's got to fit with the character that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And my character is utterly, you know, frightened of nothing, cares about nothing, has no respect. Um, and therefore, yeah, hands in pockets is fine. I'll do whatever I want. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right, I'm going to send you guys a bunch of links to watch after this. I'm going to send you the first gig I ever did. Yeah, uh, cool. A little script to tell you. So those three rules that I talked about, just to tell you about how I ended up doing those three rules through that set, if that's okay. Yeah, brilliant. I'm via Belina, so I'll send it all to her and then yeah. pass it on to you guys. Fabulous. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we go back to our days? I'm going back to between you and that's, me. that's great, Steve. Thanks a lot. Um, really appreciate your input. And it's yeah, uh, yeah. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you, Yuka. I know you can hear. Thank you for uh, letting us use your Zoom. Thank you. Session. Brilliant. Right. See you all again soon. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs>